much. Uh, I'm yeah. a Marine. I like to just shout. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, um, thank you all for coming today. Uh, here, here we are on a Saturday uh, when you could be doing anything, um, hanging out with your family, doing whatever, but you decided to come here uh, to listen to a candidate or to uh, you know, throw questions at a candidate. Why? Because you care about our country and you care about Kentucky and the community and the future. Um, so thank you for, for coming today. Uh, I'm Amy McGrath. I, I grew up um, in Kenton County in northern Kentucky. Um, and I was very much a tomboy. All I cared about was rolling around in the mud and playing sports. I had not a political bone in my body. Uh, my parents were not hugely uh, political either. They, they always voted. I think my dad was a Republican and my mom was a Democrat. But my mother always said I vote for the person, not the party. Um, and I didn't care so much about politics at all until I actually saw a History Channel documentary. Um, I was about 10 or 11 years old, and it was a documentary of military jets flying on the back of an aircraft carrier. And I just said, that is cool. I want to do that. And I learned very quickly that women could not do that. There was a federal law prohibiting women from being fighter pilots and from being on combat ships. And so I had to learn about politics, okay? Because I had to learn how to change a law. How do you change a law? Well, hey, mom, how do you change that? They, they can't be that hard, right? Well, no, honey, there's this thing called Congress and this thing called the president. And you can't change a law, but you can advocate for change. So at the age of 11, 12, 13 years old, I became a little bit of an advocate. I wrote um, the, the local papers. I wrote my member of Congress. He was a conservative by the name of Jim Bunning, my congressman. Um, he wrote me back a half a year later, a nice, fairly condescending letter that basically said, you're a girl. And um, Congress believes that the women are precious commodities of society and should not be in these roles. I wasn't deterred. OK, that was his view. Um, I wrote my senators. Mitch McConnell never wrote me back. Um, I wrote every member of the House and Senate Armed Services Committees a letter. That's about 80 different people. I got several letters back that were just like Jim Bunnings. Um, women should not be doing this. Go do something else. You could be a nurse. You could be, you know, something else. And I got several letters back on the other side that said, hey, stick to your dreams. Um, we're, we're working on it. Our military exists to fight and win the nation's wars, and we should have the best people in those positions. Ha! Huh. That was radical at that time. Okay, you read the letters now and you're like, wow, that makes sense. But at that time, that was radical. Um, there, there was a stark difference between what political party said what. Okay, and you can imagine um, which one said what. And so that was my first understanding of the difference between Democrats and Republicans in my mind. All the Democrats said, stick to your dream for working on it. We'd like for you to be able to compete in this. All the Republicans said the opposite. Um, at the age of 18, um, I got lucky because the year was 1993, and we had a new president, Bill Clinton, and we had a new uh, Congress. It was a more, um, it was a Democratic Congress. And immediately they changed the law, and they opened up not all positions to women, but many positions in the military that were previously closed to women, uh, combat ships and combat aircraft. The, the, what my dream, what I wanted to do, was all of a sudden open to me. And I got lucky. Had I been my sister, who's four years older than me, she would not have been able to follow the same dreams that I had. Okay? So three months after that occurred, I graduated from high school and uh, went immediately to the United States Naval Academy, raised my right hand to defend the Constitution of the United States uh, as a midshipman. Four years after that, I was commissioned as a United States Marine Corps officer. Why the Marines? They're the best. All right? <laughs> they just don't. <laughs> They're the most elite. That's what I wanted, OK? They were the toughest. And, um, and so uh, that, that attracted me. Uh, I spent the next 20 years as a United States Marine Corps officer, and I got to follow that dream of flying F-18s, um, which is a fighter jet, and flying them onto aircraft carriers. And it was absolutely awesome. Um, I was able to be the first woman to do lots of things, not because I was all that good, but because the doors opened for me right at the right time. That's it, right at the right time, and I had the, the, the desire to do it. Um, I loved serving my country for 20 years. I absolutely loved it. I did uh, 
two Afghanistan tours, two combat tours to Afghanistan, and one combat tour to Iraq. Um, and I've flown all around the world, and I've got to be stationed all around the world. I, I serve with people from all walks of life, from people from the inner city to people from rural areas, all different socioeconomic backgrounds, um, different ethnicities, uh, men and women, um, you name it. And the one thing that we all served for was our country, you know? And we didn't look at each other and say, hey, are you a Democrat? Are you a Republican? <laughs> it was about our country and it was about our mission, okay? And that's one of the things I think we need a little bit more of today in, in our leadership, in our political leadership. At the end of my 20-year career, I was reaching retirement. Uh, I, along with my husband, my husband's here, um, Eric, he was a Navy pilot for 20 years. Um, and <laughs> even though he was in the Navy, as opposed to um, we, we were reaching the end of our 20 years where we could do uh, really anything. I wanted to come back home to Kentucky. Uh, this, is, this is where I'm from. And I wanted to be closer, my kids who are also here, I wanted my kids to be closer to Grammy and Papa. So we knew we were going to come home um, at some point. I, my last assignment was teaching at the U.S. Naval Academy. And I was teaching midshipmen and cadets. These are the people who are going to be 18, 19 years old right now. And they're going to be out on the front lines in places like Syria and Iraq and North Korea very soon, potentially. Potentially very soon. Um, risking their lives for our country. And what the Marine Corps sent me to the Naval Academy to teach was U.S. government. I'm trying to teach them about leadership and U.S. government. And the 2016 elections were unfolding in my last year there. I had a three-year tour. And the 2016 elections fundamentally changed me as an American. Um, I had to get up in front of these folks, uh, men and women, and explain to them what was happening to our country. Explain to them what was happening to our political leadership. Why there was seemingly no one with integrity. Um, why the, the fake news, the divisiveness, the lies, the personal attacks. Everything that I had taught to them about leadership, I could not find in the political leadership of our country. Okay? Um, and so the, the, the day after the elections, the morning after, um, with, with who we ultimately elected as Commander-in-Chief, I basically woke up with a hole in my heart. Like, what, what has just happened to our country? Where do we go from here? How do we get through this? And I realized that, you know, as a Marine, as somebody who's always stood up, as somebody who's served the country, it was at that moment that I was like, all right, I got to run for office. I'm, I'm tired of this. At that point, I didn't know when, but I knew I was going to do something, probably like many of you. I mean, how many of you, like in the 2016 elections or the aftermath, were kind of like, I got to do something. I don't know what that is yet. Maybe it's write a check to somebody. Maybe it's like get more involved. A lot of people are like that. I was too. I wasn't, prior to this point, I wasn't a, a big, you know, political person. I mean, I, I sort of felt like we were going as a nation in, in sort of the right direction. Now, I, I real, I've woken up, okay? I've woken up, and I've realized that I have done hard things in the past as a United States Marine, and running for office is hard too, but damn it, I can do it. Yes. And, and we need it. So, the Republicans had started to push through their repeal and replace plan for the Affordable Care Act, um, which the Affordable Care Act, for all of its faults, have benefited Kentucky in a lot of ways. We went from an over 20% uninsured rate to down below 5%. And so for me, I looked at that and said, this, this is crazy. They're, they're starting to push through this, this agenda, which I didn't think they would be able to do. Like, you know, before the, the president became the president, I was like, well, that's just talk. They're just trying to get the votes. And then when they actually got power, I was like, wow, they're, they're actually doing it. They're actually throwing people off of health care. They're going to try to. 
And that's when I decided, hey, I can't wait 10 years to run for office. I got to do it now. Okay, we got to do it now. And if I can make a difference, I'm going to do it right now. So I retired in, in June, um, moved home um, back here to Kentucky in July, and we launched this campaign on August 1st. Yeah. The, uh, the campaign uh, launched with a video that did fairly well, uh, <laughs> shockingly well, uh, at a national level, which is really good because it allows, it allows me to compete in a way that I would not have been able to compete with a, um, somebody who can self-fund their own campaign and somebody who is essentially bought off by special interests. I can now compete. And that is awesome. Um, so we, we launched the campaign, and the campaign's going really well. Part of this process of running for office is going out to all the 19 counties in this district. This district is 19 counties, and talking to people. And I've been doing that for the past several months, listening to people. The single most important issue, which is awesome because it's the issue I launched on, is healthcare in every 19 county of this district. No matter whether it's Wolf County or Fayette County, uh, Scott County, you name it, it's always healthcare. Um, so I'll just th throw out my thoughts on healthcare right now for everybody. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, what happened this, this past week, right, in Florida. Um, and after that, I, I really wanna open it up for questions because that's what this is all about, listening to you all and, and having you, you get a feel for, for where I'm coming from. Um, the Affordable Care Act, as I mentioned, has done a lot of good for Kentucky. It was never a perfect piece of legislation, folks. Never in American history, by the way, have we ever had a perfect piece of legislation, okay? Uh, but we've had some good ones, Social Security, Medicare. It's, they don't come out perfect, but we tweak them over time. We don't throw them away. The Affordable Care Act was never designed to get prices under control. It was designed to get more people insured, and it worked. We got more people insured. Now we gotta work on getting prices under control, but the answer to that is not to throw, throw people off of healthcare and make them more uninsured again, all right? And so that's the big, the big thing. I think we ought to have people that actually get into office that want to fix the Affordable Care Act, to want to make it better, that want to make not only the Affordable Care Act better, but our entire healthcare system in this country better, okay? So while I like the concept of single payer, and I think if we were to zap ourselves back 40 or 50 years ago, single payer would probably be the way to go. That's not the system that we work, that we have today. I think we ought to work with the system that we have today and make it better. That is the American way, to tweak things, to make it better, to move in that direction so that everybody, everybody has universal coverage. Everybody. Healthcare is a right. I believe it's a right. <laughs> Just like education, basic education is a right. We had that debate 100 years ago. And now nobody's really honestly debating whether education is a right or not. Some people probably are, but. <laughs> but I think healthcare is the same thing, okay? That, that is a right of all Americans. Um, so what are some practical ways to, to work on this? Public option. All right, this was written into the Affordable Care Act bill. At the last minute, it was taken out. What is the public option? Well, right now, under the Affordable Care Act, the Affordable Care Act, by the way, about only 10% of the population is on the Affordable Care Act. Most people get their insurance through their employer or through Medicare. Uh, if you're a veteran, you might get through uh, care through the VA or Medicaid, all right? So about 10% of the population is on what we call the exchanges. In those exchanges, you can pick between private insurers. In Kentucky, there's really only one now. You only have one choice. Um, but in some parts of the country, you can pick from you know two or three. So Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Aetna, United, you pick which insurer you want. I propose we ought to have Uncle Sam as one of those. So you can pick United, Blue Cross, Uncle Sam. And if you want Uncle Sam, pick Uncle Sam. If you're afraid of government, pick, pick Blue Cross. You know? I mean, I'm not afraid of government because I, I just spent the last 24 years in socialized medicine in the military. I loved it. But not all Americans are like that. All, and Americans love choice. So give them a choice. And what, what else would that do? That would force Blue Cross Blue Shield, United, Aetna, all these, would force them to compete with Uncle Sam. All right? Which is huge. Thereby bringing down prices. 
Uh, second thing we can do is a Medicare buy-in plan. All right, so everywhere I go in all these 19 counties, there's always somebody that's, that, that is like around 55, 56 years old, who is 60, 62, who are just waiting to get onto Medicare. They can't wait. They're scared. You know, many of them are on their, under the Affordable Care Act. They have a pre-existing condition of having a baby 25 years ago. And yeah, literally. And, and, they're, and they're worried about it. And so we ought to have a plan where they could buy into Medicare, a system that everybody seems to like, secure, that's not gonna throw them off at, at the age of 55. Also, that would take some of the people out of the high risk pools into the Affordable Care Act and take them out of that and put them into, into Medicare, all right? So I think those are some practical things we can do. I do not want to be a candidate that says, hey, vote for me, and we're going to have, you know, single payer tomorrow. It's just, it's not going to happen in America. Not right now. We need to move in the direction of everybody getting coverage, but do it in a way that can actually be done. All right. Um, so I'll talk to you very briefly about th this week, because I know as I went around and, and talked to a, a, a lot of you before we started, um, a lot of you were very concerned about um, what happened in Florida with the, um, the school shooting. And it's happening more and more and more, okay? Um, this is an issue that we can't look in the other direction. Uh, it's, it's absolutely a scourge on our, on our country. Uh, I am a gun owner, okay? I've shot just about everything you could possibly imagine as a United States Marine. Um, but I'm also a mom, and I am scared for my kids, <laughs> and I do believe we need to do something about this. Uh, there are some things that almost all Americans, including all gun owners, almost all gun owners, believe we should do. Uh, things like taking away bump stocks, you know, um, things like better background checks, things like um, the, the fact that the mentally ill should, should not be able to walk into BUDS and get an AR-15, okay? Um, things like if you are on a terrorist no-fly list, you should not be able to walk into BUDS and get an AR-15, you know? We ought to do those. We ought to do those immediately. And then the other things that people are, are suggesting, we ought, to, we ought to be able to sit down and talk about, okay? Um, we ought to talk about whether an 18-year-old should be able to get an assault weapon. You know, can't, can't get a beer, all right? These are just like practical things, okay? Um, the problem is right now that the politicians, um, namely on the right, are completely bought off by a special interest group, and you know which one I'm talking about, all right? Mm -hmm. But we have to address it in a way that we, we, we talk to the, the, the culture of America, too. I'm a gun owner. I don't, I believe you should have the right to bear arms if you want to have a weapon, you should be able to have it. It is in, in our Constitution. But we, we ought to be able to have a conversation about this, okay? Um, you know, automobiles can go out and kill people too. <clears throat> we figured that out in the 1920s and 1930s when we had all kinds of automobile accidents. We have some, some reasonable restrictions on automobiles now. A, you have, to, you, know, you have to take a class to get a license, you know? I mean, these. We ought to be able to sit down, and that's, that's what I want to do. But I honestly think you have to have people in office that have the credibility to, to talk about this. So it's a, you have to be able to have a, somebody who's a gun owner to be able to say, hey guys, we need to talk about this. All right, And that's where I come from. I will challenge any of my competitors to shoot with me. Uh. Any. <laughs> All right? So bring it. I'm, and I'm, I'm uniquely capable of being able to have this conversation with people. So that's what I would say about this. And it really is about our kids and about gun safety as well. All right. So with that, um, I really want to open it up for questions from you. And I'll try to go as quickly as I can because I know we have a UK game 